Welcome to CFD for Industry. I'm Cade Beck, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we'll pull back the curtain on what it takes to do successful CFD for Industry. We'll talk with industry experts at the leading edge of technology who have diverse business, consulting, and research and development experience. So join me as we learn together about what it takes to do CFD for Industry. Shatiz Segal is a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on multi-phase flows. In today's episode, you'll learn what it's like to get a PhD in CFD. Awesome. All right. Shatiz, it's nice to have you on the show today. Thank you. And Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really great to be talking with you. I want to just really jump right in and ask you, what problems are you working on like right now with CFD? What's it look like? So right now I'm working on three different problems using CFD. All of them, they kind of, I'm working on these problems to support my PhD work. My PhD work is primarily a phase change problem based on refrigerants and absorbents, how uh, I deal with the vapor absorption. So I'm trying to simulate that. And since it's a phase change problem, I'm trying to do a lot more validation using two more analytical solutions. One specifically for resolving a gas into a liquid and the other one is for pure condensation just to support my uh, validated model for vapor absorption problems. So yeah, those are the three problems I'm working on at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. Very complex. Lots of stuff going on. Let's, yes. Maybe let's back up a little bit then. Um, so you're, you're at Texas A&M in yes. a PhD program, but what was your yes. first experience with CFD? How did you get introduced to it? Where did this sure. all start for you? So when I was in undergrad, I was primarily doing experimental work, but uh, I had some idea uh, because folks around me, they would take a course in CFD and you would imagine, okay, what are these guys doing? A lot of solving a bunch of equations. And uh, at the time I wasn't aware about, you know, how we get colorful contour plots and uh, all the jokes that go around. But once I got to Penn State uh, in my master's program, I worked with an advisor who kind of offered me different variety of projects. He said, you know, this is something, electronic schooling is something that he offered. And then the other option was to work on uh, atomistic simulations and molecular dynamics. And I think uh, I liked the electronic schooling uh, part better than the atomistic simulations because of the direct application. I'm not saying MD doesn't have, but at the time, based on my understanding, I appreciated electronic schooling more than uh, atomistic simulations and that kind of led me to learn CFD so I wasn't really trained but then he gave me the learning opportunity to begin with I started with ANSYS Fluent. Uh, Cornell Confluence is my go-to resource anytime if for, for people who are listening or watching us. Cornell Confluence if you google it and type Fluent Tutorials that was my starting point and then okay. I took a formal class later. Okay that's yeah. um that's interesting hearing how people come in contact with it. Cause a lot of times it's, it's like this, it's, Hey, we've got a problem we're working on. We yes. know CFD can do it. And that's people's first exposure to it. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So with that, what was your undergrad in? So my undergrad was in aerospace engineering, Okay. purely uh, aerospace, mainly uh, focus, focus on uh, aerospace propulsion. So the work that I did in my undergrad, I have to give credit to my professor from uh, undergrad, Professor Vinayak Malhotra, who introduced me and other people in my cohort to, you know, research, formal scientific research. We started with some experimental work on impinging jets and believe it or not i at the time when i think about it when i look back i was just i think sophomore year or rising junior i came to the us and i presented a paper so yeah <laughs> and when i think about it now that i'm doing actual phd work writing papers or you know going to conferences i'm like how did i do that because it was him so yeah uh, uh, that's that's what my undergrad was all about so i think uh, yeah that's, uh, was that your question as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just just I how think. you just had made the comment about the cooling and the electronic school. And you just had a greater appreciation for that. Yes. And so yes. I was just curious yes. what your undergrad yeah. was there. But that that is incredible that your advisor yeah. was able to mentor you through that process to have that experience as an undergrad. Not many people get Not, to present yes. research in the first place as an undergrad, yeah. but internationally, that, that's yeah. an awesome experience. 
That's yeah. great. I'd like to talk about this too. We've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I think one of the main questions on a lot of people's mind is, okay, I, I've seen the the results of CFD simulations and yes. it looks cool. Yes. It's something I know I want to do more of, but transitioning from maybe they've had some exposure to it in undergrad or they, they've had an aerospace undergrad like you or uh, general mechanical and they want to go to grad school outside of their country. So can you walk us through what what things did you do? I mean, you went to Penn State for the master's and then coming to Texas A&M for the PhD, but maybe give us a little more detail for someone in a similar position. What what things might help them as they're trying to navigate those decisions and opportunities? To kind of catch up on CFD if they think CFD can be a potential option in grad school. Is that and, and maybe not even catch up. Just how did you do it? I think uh, something that I apply to every situation in my life is just keep pushing, right? Mm -hmm. I started with CFD. And here I want to give credit to my master's thesis advisor, Professor Ramos Alvarado at Penn State Mechanical. Professor, if you're watching this, thank you so much for giving me the learning opportunity. I think first, sparing some time aside for learning is important. Start with that. Second is you have to be equipped with the right kind of tools. And sometimes with with things like CFT, it's hard to decide. You know, there are a bunch of software out there. You use Star CCM for your PhD. I started with CCM, then I moved to ANSYS Fluent, and in between I explored Open Foam. So oftentimes people don't know where to start with. I would say just start with anything. Just start. And then things will come into place. Uh, things will fall into place if you just keep pushing. Pick any software. YouTube is your friend. And if you don't really want, if you're in a foreign land, not in the United States where, you know, resources are easily available, you probably want to start with open form. It's free of cost. Uh, you can download it on Windows or on Mac. I have a Mac, so I can tell you that I use on it all the time. And uh, it's free of cost. And, the, and YouTube is filled with excellent tutorials. And there is excellent documentation by Open Open Form community on several web pages or YouTube videos which are available. Now, that's the first part. Second part is you want to you know keep pushing. People might look at some differential equations. You know, as an undergrad, when someone would show me, oh, uh, partial derivative of density with time plus uh, you know gradient of velocity vector and blah 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 is equal to zero. If it's equal to zero, why do I need to solve it? <laughs> you know, as an undergrad, you would think like that. But as as you spend more time, you will get uh, familiar with the nature of those equations and what they do. And I think that's where people will get, let's say, more familiar with all of that. And that will kind of pave the way for them to have a career in the CFT or to kind of explore CFT as a direction. I think that's what I would do if I had to start all over again and I had no help. Yeah, great, great insight there. That's, I just want to second that with my experience, it takes time. And I think yes. you don't learn CFD overnight. And so yeah. just accepting the reality, going into it with yeah. both eyes open, hey, th this yeah. is complex. This is difficult yeah. math that you don't just mm -hmm. absorb in one go, but just being persistent and consistent in, in learning it and, and pushing through. I really like that. It's, it's great. I want to share one experience. I think this was fall of 2017 when my uh, master's thesis advisor, he said, do you know any CFT? I said, no, professor. He's like, okay, here's a computer. We are giving you, you know, he gave me all the uh, links to ANSYS manuals because I think Fluent was his tool of choice. And I looked at all that. I still remember looking at ISM CFT. I'll touch on it maybe later. ISM CFT as a meshing tool and... Uh, what is this? I had no clue. And the first problem I solved was, I believe, uh, flow between two parallel plates where you have both the plates fixed and you get a velocity profile at the end and there's a closed form solution for it. I validated that. I had some idea about, you know, Navier-Stokes. And luckily for me, the tutorial that I was using, it's by a professor at Cornell and he walks you through the black box. Most people tend to overlook that. So people, please, if you're starting out with CFT, uh, please make sure you understand you're dealing with a black box and it's very important to you know go through the whole idea of in, input and output to a black box or output from a black box so yeah i i presented the problem to him i said look there's flow between two parallel plates i had some idea of what was going on but it wasn't until he explained to me that look this velocity contour means that there's a fully developed velocity profile at the outlet it wasn't until then that i understood the meaning of those equations. 
So this is something I wanted to touch and add to uh, our discussion about this question. Yeah, lots of great things there. And it's it's coming out as we're talking about it too, yeah. but just emphasizing as as you start with CFD, there's a lot of things that will help you accelerate your progress, right? So it's definitely good to, to start somewhere, but starting in the right place and having the right framework mm -hmm is extremely helpful, right? We've kind of alluded to it. a yeah. mentor. It, YouTube yeah. can take you far, but yeah. it is impossible to replace a mentor who's invested in your exactly. success like exactly. that. So I think one of the other questions that I get asked a lot often is, is it necessary to get a graduate degree to get really good at CFD? And the more I've reflected on that, it no, certainly no. grad school should provide an opportunity yes. and a more formal setting for that network, that mentorship, yes. access to resources, yes. but it, it's by no means the only no. way at all, no. at all. So yeah, there, there yeah. are people out there on LinkedIn. Oh, I notice all the time. Uh, they have an undergraduate degree. They're doing really well. And, you know, with, with the advancement in technology, you notice how people are leveraging all the resources available online and solving meaningful problems. Yeah. I, I see that. And yes, I, I totally agree with you. You don't need a graduate degree and it just gives you an opportunity because another aspect that I wanted to touch base here is uh, in grad school, you know, the, the formal way of doing it is you take a CFT course where they start with the governing equations, the continuity momentum, maybe energy in some cases and oftentimes the title of a cfd course is numerical heat transfer and fluid flow but what about other scalars uh, or other governing equations uh, in a multi-physics problem so the assumption is you know that you will eventually take care of them if you learn to solve continuity momentum and energy energy equation and something i want to get your feedback on or your thoughts on is that typically any cfd class you start with the conservation equations you move on to discretization grid development and eventually into uh, our friend simple algorithm and solve maybe a lid driven cavity problem or you know channel flow problem or something like that using a matlab code or c++ that's the end of the course but on a daily basis, we don't deal with channel flows. We don't deal with single phase cavity lid driven problems. So I want to get your thoughts and maybe people who are watching this. How can we complement the grad school knowledge? Should should courses be made better or should they, you know, kind of refresh the content of the courses so that they can complement some of the real life problems that you and I, we both deal with two phase flows. But I think a typical CFT course in any grad school probably will not touch on that. They might touch on turbulence. I, I know uh, some professors who teach turbulence here, but again, I, I think we have some, uh, some room there to kind of improve the courses as well. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great, a great point. So a little bit more background about me. I started working in a physical laboratory um, doing water research in my undergrad. And so all of my degrees are civil and environmental engineering. Um, mm -hmm. And so definitely a non-traditional CFD path from what's common introduced in mechanical aerospace, right? And what I saw was because I had seen free surface flows, right? That's, that's what mm -hmm. a lot of uh, water resources stuff is. But Right. I found that it really depends on what your professors in the program are doing. I, there are a lot of yeah. universities I know that do have multi-phase. So I think that that can be yeah. very program specific, what yes. courses they're offering, if they've yes. got a multi-phase research yes. group going on. Yes. But I also think, and you alluded to this earlier, there's a lot of courses being put out on Coursera and other places that do cover and introduce you to some of those problems. And I think anyone in CFD should also check out Fluid Mechanics 101 on YouTube. Aiden. Yes. Aiden does a great yeah. job. Those are excellent videos. Yeah. Um, there's lots of others that we could add to that list as well. That's just one that I was introduced to early on. I have personally used a lot of his YouTube videos, especially when he talks about different kind of gradient calculation schemes. I don't know if we have time to talk about it, but that has had a great influence on the results that I got for my PhD. So that's that. Specifically, you know, uh, I wanted to point out about your uh, LinkedIn post from a couple of days ago where you talk about this multi-phase modeling textbook by Professor Andrea Prosperity from University of Houston. He's a great guy. I'm using his work, his students' work from last five years or so to make my case for the future work for my PhD. Awesome. So, yeah. So those kind of problems and the content that he covers in his textbook, 
I think you will not find that in a CFT course. I'm not betting on it, but I'm guessing that's the case. Yeah, I, I don't know. I Our program didn't have a lot of CFT specific courses. Well, it had none in the civil department. So I was taking courses mm -hmm. taught by the mechanical and aerospace department. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember there being a multi-phase course offered. Yeah, definitely more rare. But that that's another thing too, though. You look at the investment over a career. And right. even if you buy the full textbook, there's there's a lot of um, ways you can access different books. I mean, the ebook, other versions you can purchase, but most of the time now the, the hurdle is just getting lower and lower to access the right information. And it's just now the deluge of information, sorting out mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. stuff and where to start with and having someone right. to guide you along that way. And that's where a mentor just right. becomes invaluable in that process, yeah. right? Because yeah. you cannot yeah. consume everything that's out there. I agree. It's I agree. impossible. You've got to pick and start somewhere and then refine that as you go along. I so that's agree. one yes. of the intents of starting this podcast is I was told to go upstairs and go learn CFD. And uh, I, I wish I would have found something like what I hope this will be. One other, maybe kind of changing gears here, CFD is certainly important. And what I found was I was surprised especially as you're transitioning from, from maybe this, this really rigorous book learning mindset of undergrad, it, there is a shift as you go into grad school, if you do continue that way or learning on your own in the industry, there, there's definitely a shift. And because of the, the lack of formal structure that accompanies an undergraduate degree or that is in an undergraduate degree that is often not as formal or rigorous in a graduate degree or non-existent in industry, depending right. on your company setup, the other skills start to come into play and have a huge impact on that. So I just wanted right. to ask you about some non-CFD skills that have contributed so, to and enhanced your success yeah. as becoming a uh, CFD engineer and that process. That's that's a great question. And uh, I'll use one word to answer that question. I think the word is documentation. If you know how to document your CFD simulations, at least in my case, it has greatly and immensely helped me uh, make progress. Starting from my master's degree, I still remember when I started out uh, in fall 2017 with tutorials, I would take notes, uh, you know, start with continuity momentum. And I had a notebook and I'd just keep noting down, keep noting down. And then when I finally moved on to uh, solving my real problem, which was building a 3D heat sink for electronics cooling, the challenging part was building the mesh because it's a complex geometry. Even though you use quarter symmetry or half symmetry to kind of reduce the size of the, com size of the computational domain, uh, domain, meshing a 3D domain takes time and you don't know what's the best meshing algorithm, how to extract the fluid volume. This is ANSYS Fluent I'm talking about, and this is recent versions, 2017, 2018. All those things, they were a learning curve for me. And I noted each and everything down. And today when I meet with new master's students in my current research group, I just point them, this YouTube video, this page, go there, don't go anywhere else. And that was my starting point. I would write everything down. Now I use Microsoft Excel and MS Word all the time. Anytime I'm running a simulation, there is, I can, maybe I can show it to you later. All the simulations that I've run since September of last year, I have a record of that. Starting with the mesh settings, how many nodes, how many elements, was there any anything important that I should note down so that when I go back to that particular mesh or run a simulation using that mesh. So there is a big Excel workbook one sheet is meshing, one sheet is setup, one sheet is results, and one sheet is any comments. So that has immensely helped me. Something something like prescribing a parabolic velocity profile, which we come across all the time. I, I use the, the expression, plug that in uh, MS Excel. You can get a graph and take those numbers, put that in a text file, give it to ANSYS Fluent. I'm telling you, Fluent will make more mistakes when you know you're giving it a UDF or to kind of put that profile. And the expressions editor in Fluent is not that robust at the, at this point, at least in time. You can go online and I can verify my claim. So MS Excel came in handy. Use it all the time. Yeah, excellent, excellent point here. Um, I just want to dive into a specific real quick and then comment on the general comment of documentation. But for someone who may not have done this, you're saying to speed up your results, you import your initial velocity profile into your simulation, just calculating yes. the analytic power law 
uh, I'm saying, let's say you have an you have a velocity profile expression that your problem needs to prescribe an inlet boundary condition. Instead okay. of typing that expression in a UDF, if you're still learning. Okay, just to import or, the table or the text file. Yeah, Got just it. just plot it in Excel because Excel that way is easier. Yeah, it's more intuitive. If you're making mistakes, it will tell you, and you can plot this the thing at the same time, and you will know if it makes physical sense yeah. or not. So you're getting your validation and your input in one file. Yeah, and whatever output you get, you can bring it back to the same Excel file and compare both of them. Yeah, no, that's great. So That's great. Yeah, yeah um, I definitely remember doing the same thing. I, my test matrix just got so complex that yes. I couldn't keep track. Uh, yeah. your, your file name becomes the full yeah. <laughs> final, yes. final, final version 23. Yes. And it just keeps going. And for this, you know, for... Getting to this practice of using MS Excel and Word, I have to give, give credit to my buddy from undergrad, uh, Rohan Kapoor. He's working at ASML in California. And since, you know, in industry, they handle a lot of projects at time. This is something he learned and he taught me. He kind of okay. pushed me. Hey, you, you have to do this. Otherwise, you will lose track of things. Yeah. And uh, let me be honest. I'm not able to track everything. As you are saying, you know, we lose track at some point. Yeah. But I think it's a good exercise. At least whatever information I have, uh, it's helpful. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the future, whenever I start working, I would probably make sure that from day one, I push myself to to do this as an active practice. Yeah, we're definitely uh, never going to be perfect at documentation, but being committed to it and striving for that yeah. helps when you come back to a problem three months because you got pulled off on some other portion yeah. in your, your grad school work. So yeah. that also suggests the same thing. I did that with my lit review very rigorously. I'd read yeah. an article. I'd summarize. I got this from Cal Newport's, one of his Deep books. Work. I can't remember. Maybe. Deep and it might've been in so good they can't ignore you, but summarizing what they covered, what the methodology was, what their results were, and then mm -hmm. what questions were left unanswered or critiques perhaps on the yes. research. And, and that was so useful in yes. going through the lit review. So documentation, yeah. documentation will pay off every time. Yes, um, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And, and it's, it's tempting. I, I, I still find myself in this position. It's tempting to move on to the next step because it's exciting, right? You're getting results and to not stop and take the yeah. time to document. Yeah. So it's a little bit pulling back on the reins. Yeah. Of yeah. wanting to keep going, which is, yeah, it, it always pays off though, for sure. Can you describe, and you kind of touched on this where it clicked, but maybe there's another experience as well, where you really felt like you started to get a handle on CFD and some deeper understanding. Obviously we're all continuing to learn and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. fill in gaps that we feel we might have or expanding that to a yeah. different domain or branch, but yeah. could you describe an experience and, and what that was like and what led to it? Two experiences come to mind. I think first is my PhD problem that I'm working on. Second is my internship experience at Corning Research and Development. And more than the experience, I think it's the mentor because I solved, I, I kind of uh, worked on a model which dealt with thermal characterization of optical fibers. And it's a complex problem. You have, you know, radiation heat transfer, you have conduction convection. So all three modes of heat transfer Plus, you're dealing with glass, which is a complex material in itself. So that's the first part over there. Setting up or understanding the physics of the problem was, of course, challenging when I was working uh, at the company. But my mentor or my supervisor over there, again, uh, giving credit to Dr. Pushkar Tandon, who is, if you Google him, you will know who he is. He's the inventor of bend insensitive optical fiber and very experienced guy. He gave me a very different perspective. So that's when I actually felt, you know, I had a greater or deeper understanding of CFD. And his perspective, I would like to share it with everyone is you look at the equations, the governing equations, you know, I'm, I'm tying it back to my original point as an undergrad, when I would look at the PDEs, and I was like, everything is equal to zero, why do we need to solve it? <laughs> or at least the right hand side is equal to zero for continuity. So, so he lent me that perspective tackle the governing equations one term at a time. And this is a perspective which changed my life, at least from CFD perspective. I was able to solve most of the problem that I was assigned at Corning. And then when I got back, I applied that perspective to my PhD work. And that's when things started changing. So I learned about, first of all, understanding the contribution of each term. You know, we all we all deal with momentum equation. It has a pressure drop term and viscous uh, term and body forces and everything. But what's the influence of each and every term? 
it, it kind of needs to come as a second nature to you that okay these are the equations and you kind of need to go with the flow like in literal sense <laughs> you know what i mean so Love the pun yeah that that's what i think that that was my uh, you know turning point when i felt yes now i'm starting to understand and then eventually started making progress uh, in the direction of mesh generation in in the direction of coupling the physics with the kind of mesh that you're using the influence that that is one direction the other direction is your numerical scheme which i explored over time you pick up any two phase flow paper in you know which is done on ansys fluent people will use geometric reconstruction as the common way of resolving the interface geo reconstruct it's basically a piecewise linear interface capturing method from my work i learned you know sometimes academic papers they kind of they're so hard on certain numerical schemes that you always feel that oh you know what this is the only way to solve a problem i think that's not true i learned that the hard way in my phd i'm using different set of you know algorithms and schemes and i have been able to validate some of my results or perhaps you know i found one combination which was the only one that worked for me now people might say oh you got lucky maybe i got lucky but i had to go through all of that to kind of understand go through that grind to understand what is the influence of each selection that i made in the software onto the results so that's my learning experience when i started to feel okay i finally learned something in cft thank you for sharing that that's it's really really neat when you when you get to that point where you really yeah. start to feel like, okay, I can look at yeah. a problem and I, I can translate the equations yeah. into their physical meaning, right? That's that's what it, being able to go through term by term. Okay, what what is this really physically describing? This mm -hmm. mathematical representation, what is it physically describing? That's great. Last question, maybe a little bit more of a logistics question, but I think if you could just speak to real briefly, what helped you submitting your applications to grad school? Like that's, that's a topic that we could mm -hmm. probably spend a lot mm -hmm. of time on as well, but just yeah. maybe some, some, something you wish you would have known about applying to grad schools internationally that you know now sure. as you've gone through two. That's, that's a great question. I think clarity is the first word. And second word is keeping your option. I know we have a time time crunch here, but I'll, I'll wrap it up with that. So clarity, when I say clarity, as an undergraduate student, when I was in India, I was working on a, a research problem. Yes, there was a mentor and people to guide me. And I knew what was happening, at least with my problem. Some idea, I was not, an, I did not have an expert level understanding because I was still learning. But when it came to grad school, I did not have any mentors or people who I knew who were, you know, here or in different countries who could tell me that this is how you pick a professor. This is how you pick a grad school. This is how you decide on a program. And this is how you look at a university. I applied to a bunch of places. When it came to Penn State, my only motivation at the time, so since my work had to do with experimental work with respect to impinging jets, I was I had done a bunch of internships and I was interested in exploring fluid thermal sciences in, in a gas turbine combustor or, you know, aerospace propulsion applications. Mm -hmm. Penn State at the time was on top of my list because they had an experimental rig with compressors and there was a professor at the time who, and I got into the school because I made my case using my undergraduate research and I got accepted. Of course, there was no financial support initially, but there was only one professor who was doing that. And when I got to Penn State, things did not work out as planned. Again, not going to get into the details. There were some things that did, which did not work out. And then I eventually had to find another advice. So that's how I switched to an electronic schooling problem. Good thing is I kept an open mind when this happened. So something that people should keep in mind that even though they get into the school of their choice, it's not necessary that they will end up working on that. Then that's the part at Penn State where I switched from doing experimental work, transitioning into CFD, learning CFD, solving my first problem, getting a paper out, graduated from there. a and I put in an application, got in, and here I had my advisor who, you know, he had a project and using my skills, since I had transitioned officially into mechanical engineering from aerospace, my CFT skills and my past work, he said, okay, would you be interested in a project? Two-phase flows, I had never worked on them, volume of fluid method or Eulerian multiphase. He said, there's going to be a learning curve and you know you will have to. So yeah, that, that was pretty much it. But again, it's use my undergrad work to get into Penn State, Penn State work to get into A&M. And that's how it has been. I think your original question was what people can do to get more clarity. A&M initially, 
you know, there was no plan as such. By the time I decided that I really want to get a PhD, most of the deadlines had passed. And AM is a good school. It had a, a good heat transfer faculty. So that was mainly the motivation. I also applied to University of Toronto, but I did not get in because over there, they are like a professor needs to pick you. Mm. So uh, that was another thing. But AM, I think I was lucky that way that, you know, I got in and was able to work with my advisor on a problem. So it was a good match. Honestly, I have struggled a lot through this uh, problem for three years, but I really like the work that I'm doing. I feel that, you know what, if I, I'm, I'm ready to put in more time, no problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was like my transitioning journey from, you know, undergrad to master's, master's to having more clarity. I will say this about my PhD, my thesis advisor really inspired me because I was his first master's student. He was fresh out of grad school. So both, okay. you know, young minds working together. And I used yeah. to look at, uh, look up to him. Oh, he's a great professor. I, I used to sit in his heat transfer classes just to get a feel for how he teaches and everything. That inspired me. Oh, no, I want to be like him someday. And now I'm working with a senior professor. And the it's a totally different ball game when you work with a young professor and you work with a senior professor. Their priorities are different. Their expectations are different. And it's hard to manage those expectations. And I say that in a good way because that's where a lot of independent learning happens. So to people out there who are planning to apply for a PhD, keep in mind your advisor matters, right? If if you are if you plan to work with a senior professor, please, please make sure you know their expectations very clearly because if you don't know about that, you're going to have issues. You're going to struggle because they don't have time to hold you by the hand. And that is something I assumed. Oh, you know what? My former advisor was like this. Maybe all the professors are like that. And that's not the case. I struggled. And I'm thankful to him for that for that opportunity because had he not let me struggle, I wouldn't have gotten to the point I am. So thanks to my PhD advisor for that. And I, I think I will still need to thank him uh, once I get to the finish line. So I'll I'll keep that for that time. No, great, great insight there. It's definitely an ongoing thing, right? As people are looking at these applications, there's a lot to look at of what does the program offer? What have they historically been researching? What are the specific professors doing currently? And just getting an idea of that and going in both eyes open that things might not play out and often don't play yeah. out how you initially yeah. think, but being able yeah. to adapt. And oftentimes those decisions that you make, right? Like switching from the jet impingement to the heat transfer can lead yeah. to great opportunities still as long as you put in the work yeah. and and yeah. really just try to understand and and grow yeah. from it so that's excellent yeah i think my advisor used to used to say and i i tell it all the time to any people who i meet from undergrad is you need to take your chances in life uh especially in grad school and you need someone who can take a chance on you i think uh, synergy of both of those things can take you places. And yeah. th that's what happened to me. I'm not saying I'm super successful at this point in my life, but I'm really grateful for all, all the people who have taken a chance on me. We, may it be my undergraduate professor, may it be my master's thesis advisor, or may it be my current advisor. And yes, there are challenges, but as long as you keep pushing, you will get there sooner yeah. or later. No, that's great. That's great. Well, it's been great to, to visit with you and learn more about your research and to Thank talk you. again. I always enjoy our discussions, just as... Um, uh, Likewise. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, good luck crossing the finish line. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you will know about it. You know, I, I keep in touch with you all the time, but I'll, I'll keep you posted. Thank you for listening. Really, thank you. What happens next is the most important part of the episode. Pick one thing that you can do in the next day to apply what you learned. Then do that one thing. See you on the next episode.